it started up, I mean, we were really looking for different things to do. And we didn't know really how to, to, to go about it. I was just put out and say, right, go forth and multiply. Well, that means something totally different, as we both know. Um, but nonetheless, how do we do this? So I cottoned on to something I saw in a pub down in England, actually. And I'd been down there <coughs> for a few days. And I saw this calibrated stack standing on a bar counter. And it had on it 5, 10, 15, all the way up. And this was what they called a pile of pennies column. And I thought, well, how can we do something about this? It's all very well having one in a pub. But if you had a few, you could have a competition. Now this was something that uh, this was something that we we cottoned on to, and it 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 went from it, it really gathered feet and legs, it gathered wheels and ran, and it was really amazing. I went one well, I actually still hold the Scottish record for a pile of pennies in a pub in a competition. And this happened actually in Stornoway because I ultimately landed over in Stornoway having spreading my wings as it were and I went to I went to um, the round table as a matter of fact and I said look would you be interested in this and the money is raised for this was going to Talking Books in the National Library for the Blind so we hung it on that, as it were, and the table agreed that they would do this. And the record in that pub, it's in one of the pubs in the foreshore in Stornoway, is 3,500 quid. Now, <laughs> yeah, it, you're going to knock me over with a feather, because that was absolutely staggering. And they still hold it, and they probably will never relinquish it because nobody else I think will ever do that but the pile of pennies we, we spread it around we had we had um, the, the, the idea of, of having these piles of pennies yes was to raise money but actually the organization got a bit profile out of this as well besides the finance because what happened was that we invited special guests to come and knock these things down now we had the late Andy Stewart, we've had Peter Morrison, we've had Johnny Beatty, we've had um, <coughs> all sorts of variety artists, we've had various various musicians, we've had Willie Miller from the Dons, we've had other football players, etc. Sir Alec Ferguson uh, uh, has been very uh, supportive of us in his time in Aberdeen. And, uh, you know, all of these people came and they made it for the pub because they had a special day and they had a special night and you went to this particular pub at a certain time and the guest artist appeared, well, the guest being Mel Sir Alec or, or, or whoever, we've had Alec McLeish, we've had a few. And, you know, that, that, that was the way to, I found, uh, presenting it like that, you were able to, you were able to... Um, make the thing work because you had to make it work otherwise there's you know there'll be no point of me being in the job I want to turn to another uh, thing that uh, that we did was abseils now I know that you've clambered down off the fourth bridge uh, you lucky chap uh, I've crossed it perhaps more times than you've clambered down it but never mind um, <clears throat> nonetheless well done you however we decided we would do abseils and it was hard work because you had to recruit people to do it. Now the way we did it was going around um, works and uh, various um, employments, you know, uh, people with large employment, employees, sorry, it's all the tea that does this, you see. Um, anyway, we went round all these people and we got them to we got them to to uh, sign up to do it, and they went and got sponsorship, etc. 
and <coughs> it was it, we did them we did them in Inverness we did them in um, Aberdeen we did them in Dundee so I mean we really had a great we had a great uh, response for these the last one that we ever did and I I just retired I had to retire early because of health reasons but the last one that I did we raised on the day uh, after all the spade work we raised 53,000 quid now that was an awful lot of work an awful lot of leg work a tremendous amount of office work but you had 53,000 quid so it was really it was really quite a it was quite a big uh, um, event I used to go and do a lot of talks well as you know I can talk quite a bit but I used to go and do a lot of talks to people and to organizations to rotaries to this and to that spreading the message <coughs> I I remember being in uh, Inverness and I had and I say this to you I had the whole of the Eden Court stage all to myself I was flat bang in the middle of it talking to a guild rally now <coughs> I I'd done my thing I'd come off stage and was sat at the table having coffee with the, the president and whoever else however she said look I want to introduce you to this man and he was the late Professor Willie Bartley of Glasgow University he was a lecturer in theology at Glasgow University anyway <coughs> I I sat down and I was introduced to him and I said oh, hello hello sir he said look my name's not sir I'm Willie that's how I want you to address me and you know you're never brought up to just say Charlie or Willie or whoever to someone that you've never met you know you, your upbringing teaches you that you don't get that however that was how it was and he said I noticed that you never spoke about money I said no I, I, uh, I don't because I'm invited as a charity to speak to an organization they know what I'm doing and they know how to do their thing in order to assist us and that is how it's that's how I work it and he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to say something to you, Stanley. He says, uh, and he said, when my granny was at her last, she took me to, to her side and she said, now look, Willie, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to be and you're going to be successful. But she says, always remember that people come first. Make sure that people come first. And if people come first, you will succeed. Yes, transport is, is uh, well, I, I, I came into this actually, I came into the transport thing when I was still with RNIB actually, because I was drafted um, from RNIB, still had to do my job with RNIB, but I was, I was uh, involved with DIPTAC, now that's the Department of Transport's Advisory Committee. Now they met in London, and still do actually. And um, I was going up and down to London more times than I was uh, having a cup of tea. Now it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as that, but it was getting pretty serious actually. But however, the RNIB wanted me to be on it, I was representing them. And I was on actually, you, you've seen, I'm quite sure, the bus services they have in Aberdeen. I know they're expensive, I'm sad to say, but they had they had the advent of the low floor bus. Now I respect that uh, there are lots of people who would never know anything but the low floor bus now and I, you know that's understandable because wheelchairs can get on and off it very easily. But in my young days, they didn't have low floor buses, of course, it was steps. And there are still steps in some buses. However, I was on this very first low floor bus. And a bit of a funny story to this, actually. Uh, well, it turned out to be funny. I was on uh, a small group of people who were showing 
uh, the, uh, the Prince of Wales round the exhibition at Crowthorne in Barchurch, beside Reading. And <laughs> one of the one of the things that happened was that we would get them on board one of these low floor buses, which they'd taken to the showground. So they got them onto the they got them onto a wheelchair, and uh, they said, "Right, okay, now there's the ramp there. Get yourself up onto there. You see, see what you think. Nobody was going to push you. You were going to do it yourself." However, uh, we were standing just at the sides of the, the ramp. And I wasn't paying too much attention. Did he not roll over the toes with his wheelchair, which was quite painful. Um, however, he, he came across, to be fair, he profusely apologised and uh, hoped that I was okay. So, uh, you know, I, there's nothing. It was just an innocent mistake. The, I was, as a carer at the time, I got respite from choices uh, when Westburn Park and uh, mum was a client so she, she got the benefit of the, of the centre. That was council run. In uh, 2008 they closed it due to budget cuts and uh, we protested like, you know, again, any decent human being would. You're taking our centre away from us because we're going to speak out and things. So it got a lot of coverage in the, in the local media and the press and uh, sadly our fight didn't, you know, sustain didn't save the centre, but then it realised, well, we can actually fill a gap, we can actually do something about it. These people are going to lose their livelihood, me included, and my mum, hence why at that time I started to build up a real appetite for campaigning, again, through my mum, because she, you know, the day, the day that I got the call, and you have to say to your mum, you're not longer going to get social inclusion. Hater and somebody that, you know, and respite, it killed me, because then you find I was getting my respites cut. And then, um, you know, and they... And they sent to your mum, you're not, you're not going to yeah. see some of your friends again. Yeah, so that was a really tough day. I woke up actually quite positive that day. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Woke up, it was a normal day, and then we got the phone call from the manager saying, as of such and such date, you're not going to be able to come anymore with no bus coming for you, etc, etc. So we were left really with nothing. And then that kind of, my level of anger turned to positivity. As crazy as that sounds, that when you're in that position to turn anger into positivity, you have to because, you know, finally, you know, you can't just sit down, do nothing. You have to step up to do something. So I think that's one thing that makes you stand out, the fact that you could just so, oh well, it was great while it lasted, but no, I decided, no, let's let's do something about this, get a team together that was previous for other clients from the group, and then we decided to go and get regular, re registered with a charity, future choices, so take choices, but just put it in the future, and uh, nine years now, you know, I still get, I still think of that day, what happened, and I thought, wow, nine years later, what we have done, we've, we've overcome every single autumn. Future Choices has changed, and what I mean by that is it's gone more diverse in activities. We started off in a wee church hall in Cherixley Baptist Church, who was kind enough to give us a small, tiny room with about ten of us. Uh, I mean, just for contact, Cherixley is, is, is quite hard to get. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they were really good. We were scouting the area. It's two, it's two buses from almost everywhere in the yeah, city, really. Yeah, it's really tough to get to and we were scouting the area to find somewhere, a little base, wouldn't charge us because our funds were pfft, tiny and, you know, as a charity we were starting out but they gave us a uh, really good space and uh, we had a little small bus we started off with, we got a second hand bus and then uh, we started off doing only little activities like colouring in, really when you think about it now really silly things that you just think oh, you could do this at home but we were starting and I said to the, the folk that were there look we are starting, we will deliver more now, years down, <laughs> botcha, bowling, giant scrabble, giant set up, it's all complete and utter diverseness, we're even taking in tutors, we're, we've, we've had concerts at now where we are in Scarf Community Centre where we moved to, purely we moved there because we were just getting bigger and then I realised that after the publicity, local press were following the progress 
and uh, going obviously from choices to future choices, etc. And then they realised, and then the more promotion we were getting, uh, fo the phone was ringing, and the emails were coming in saying, "I like what you're doing," blah blah blah. That was a that to me realised this is going to be huge, and then. Now <laughs> we're regular forty members, so you can call from ten. The, the more, the more like the publicity gets around, more people want to help out, and more you know people don't stop being disabled. So you'll get referrals. Someone's had a stroke. Someone's in a wheelchair, etc. And uh, that to me just shows the essence of how much far future choice has gone. Speaking to disabled people and able body, you just sort of take in, you're always learning, you're always getting people's opinions because you can't just think yourself, you've got to speak to other people. And then it was like wheelchair users were saying to me, oh, it's awful getting access into Union Street, but nothing's ever done. That's what triggered me. I was like, what do you mean by nothing's ever done? Well, the councillors don't listen, none of them do, blah, 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 governments don't listen. I thought, okay, what's being done? So me, rather than the talking shop, I actually want to show something being done. I thought, okay, and then the, the trend got more over the last over over that weeks and stuff. I thought, okay, so if something was done, let's say if councillors were put a test, would you would you say, wow, that's something at least no, that'll never be it'll never happen. So me being me, I decided to overcome that odds by saying, right, get all you know, run representative from each party ask them politely, the whole point of this is to prove the accessibility is rubbish in Aberdeen. And it really is. From years by, enough, they have tried to be fair to do something and listen, but I've decided to say, right, let's get these people out on the streets in wheelchairs and prove it. So we did it. We started from Union Square, which I kind of wanted to choose hills. I didn't want to make it too easy for them, and they realised that afterwards. Uh, it was such an emotive day. It was, to be fair, all the politicians were amazing about it. After we we basically gone went from Union Square up round the Green, up Market Street, across Union Street, and onto Broad Street, back to the work. So it was a like the politicians were going from Union Square and taking a journey to the work, but in a wheelchair, and <laughs> they struggled. To be fair, the the oh, it was just such, it was it was a bit of a, a cold day. It wasn't raining, which I was kind of hoping it would be because that would have added more reality to it. I was being and I did say that to politicians. I'm glad it's not raining because it would have given you more a sense of more realism. You know, the wheels slipping and all that kind of thing. And it's Aberdeen. And it's Aberdeen. Exactly, and it's Aberdeen. But they realised the pavements. That was a massive issue for them. And then traffic, patience of traffic. There weren't any. Uh, the worst part, actually, one of the politicians nearly fell out of his seat, was the cobbled area of Broad Street. That was right outside their townhouse, their workplace, and all the politicians. They one one thing that they did struggle with, and, it, and it's they all brought it up, was going from Union Street across the road to Broad Street with the whole junction. The traffic lights were not giving them enough time, so you'd have the red light stopping. Then it'd be like, right, come on, move. And they were trying their best to go down the slope, but they couldn't, and then raise, they all push their shoulders, etc., and then go. But the only problem is, when the bleeping finished, the traffic was, was buzzing. Come on, out the way. They felt uh, vulnerable. They felt that they weren't being listened to by the traffic because they were like, okay, okay, okay. And I think folk were like, hold on a second, that's councillors doing that. I recognise him or her face, etc. And I think it was the right thing to do at that time to show them because once we did the evaluation afterwards and the press interviews etc they realised what has to be done a master plan and I was speaking to the councillors recently about it bringing it up what we did and they said yeah actually because we've been there now we've seen it they're not going to change overnight and nothing can be changed overnight it needs money and, and, and action but the fact that they, they've done it the fact that they've seen it and I think it's in a, that would be, I would say, one of the biggest achievements to actually, just instead of doing a wee press thing to say, I wish councillors would change the accessibility, to actually take that a step further to say, will you agree to go out? Don't care what the weather's like, will you agree to go out in a wheelchair? Uh, we did have helpers because a lot of them did struggle to get up the green, but that's why I had volunteers to help them because I was being fair. I wasn't, you know, I didn't let them away with it, everything, but they did. They were so behind it. And that's what I thought was great to have cross-party support. They were all understanding, and some of them actually do have, um, um, you know, 
understanding of disabilities. They have people, partners or whatever, friends and family of disabilities and once the news went out, I think it was well received. So hopefully it follows up with action, but the fact that they've done it, it's got to be applauded. Because they could have said no. My campaigning didn't start and end with me being an MP or being a parliamentary candidate. In fact, in 1988 I was Disabled Scot of the Year because of the work I did in the community um, in um, arguing for access. I was one of the founder members of the Forum for Access panel. But I also was fighting to make sure that more disabled people could get into teaching. The barrier I faced was the medical standards of the General Teaching Council. I couldn't get past that initially. Um, and I became active in the Teachers' Trade Union, the EIS, and so was part of a committee that looked at um, reforming the, the medical standards that the GTC used. Um, and laterally, just before I got elected, I got elected onto the General Teaching Council myself. Um, to make sure that no other disabled people coming behind me were stopped from being a teacher when they wanted to just because the medical standards equated disability and ill health. By getting the medical standards changed, it now means that someone who's a teacher who might acquire a disability, because that's the more common route to becoming um, disabled, um, that they won't now have to leave their job because there'll be nothing to, to stop them continuing in the job whether it's with a, in a wheelchair or with other support that they might need. What politicised me to begin with was actually um, fighting for civil rights for disabled people. So this, even before um, I joined the Labour Party and got active in the Labour Party, it was the civil rights side of things that I was more interested in. Um, at the time we had Margaret Thatcher's government and they were actually actively trying to block a legislation that would have made things more equal for disabled people. They eventually passed a, 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 an Act of Parliament to, in 1995 and that gave some civil rights to disabled people but they weren't enforceable and so I was delighted to stand on the platform. By this time I was a candidate for the Labour Party and I stood on the pl platform in 1997 of enforceable civil rights for disabled people. One of the first things that the Labour government in 1997 did was um, introduce the Disability Rights Commission, which would, was charged with making sure that people with disabilities had their full civil rights and they could take test cases so that they were enforceable. And throughout Labour's time in office, um, there's various equalities legislation, finishing with the Equalities Act of, of 2010, um, which actually puts an obligation on all public authorities um, to make sure that the, any decisions they take are actually to the benefit of disabled people. And so the, the legal landscape that actually gave us our, our civil rights has changed dramatically in my time in Parliament. And, you know, that, that battle has been won. But of course, there's other battles because just because it is illegal to discriminate against someone with a disability, that doesn't mean to say it doesn't happen, because it does all too often, and it can be quite difficult often to take a case. I made quite a lot of progress when you compare what life was like 40, 35 years ago for someone with a disability. If you've got a disability, you're always going to have to fight, and there will always be battles that need to be fought and won. Um, and indeed, although some people can come complacent and they find, oh, look at all these things that have changed, um, what they haven't realised that expectations have changed, and um, that the things I would have accepted in the 1980s and tried to work around, I don't think are acceptable anymore.